Hello everyone, my name is George Theofanopoulos. I am from Greece and this is our podcast for Casinoslot.gr and the podcast name is Heads Up. I know, not a, not a very original name. Today I have the honor of welcoming Veronica Brill to our podcast. Hi Veronica and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a series, a mini a series of mini documentaries at our YouTube channel called Casino Slot, where we have great stories around gambling. Uh, in one of those documentaries, mini documentaries, I think it's one of the longest ones, uh, we have the story that went down at Stone's Gambling Hall in Sacramento, a casino over there, which had the uh, poker games on live stream, uh, on live stream, yeah, with a 30 minute delay. Veronica was there and she was watching a player called Mike Postle winning a lot and in hands and in ways very weird uh, at that specific poker table which was uh, on live stream. Veronica was the first player, the first and only, who came public, went public with her suspicions uh, via Twitter and as soon as she did that, a storm of events broke out and uh, very well uh, known and established and successful play poker players saw the hands that were suspicious and they immediately agreed with Veronica, as I did. So to today we will talk about some aspects of that story that uh, we haven't talked on the documentary and I think that weren't, haven't been talked a lot. So thank you Veronica for waiting for me this long to make this long uh, introduction. And uh, let's start first with your uh, WSOP World Series of Poker. You were there at Vegas. How was the World Series for you? Um, it was okay. I'm one of those people, if I'd have just played cash, I would have come out ahead. <laughs> but I played so many tournaments. I cashed in the Millie Maker, but that was about it. It's not a great year for me. Oh, you're going there every year? Uh, most years. Last most. year, I didn't oh. really spend much time there because of uh, it came so later in the year and I just wasn't able to make it. So uh, you, you, you told us that you played cast games and you play tournaments and tournaments were costly. How difficult is for a woman to, to be successful in the, in poker, in, in today's poker? More and more men are willing to help as they have been helped by others. Do you think it's it stays, it, it's still difficult for a woman to succeed? Yeah, I think the difficulty lies in the information gatekeeping by men. Men tend to form groups with each other where they share ideas and they invest in each other, they start businesses together, they study together, and women historically have not been invited to these groups unless they're dating one of the men. And once they're not dating one of the men, they are excluded again from the information. So until we have a little less misogyny, a little more platonic interaction between men and women, and men perceive women as uh, an equal where they can share information with them, uh, which I think like a newer generation of men definitely is that. But the men in my generation definitely gatekeep a lot of information. They start businesses together. <laughs> they study together. They, and they back each other in tournaments. They swap with each other. It's a relationship, uh, a relationship that uh, the, the, the men's relationships, relationships help to do that and women are, yes, I understand what you're saying, but I haven't thought of that in, in the way you just described it. Do you actively try to improve on poker or is it just a hobby for you at this point? Um, I do actively try to improve, but I also have like a, a job and life outside of poker. And so I treat poker recreationally. I do study a bit, but um, I probably shouldn't be playing as many tournaments as I do, considering um, the lack of study that I have currently. Mm. And uh, so now let's go to the, let's start discussing about the scandal, the big scandal. That was a very interesting story. I followed it from the beginning. I was writing for, a, for another site at that time and uh, I, I really got, was fascinated and I have many questions to ask you. At first, when did you start playing? It's just to put the time frame. When did you start playing at that table, at the live stream of Stone's Gambling Hall? And when did you start feeling that something was wrong? How long in between? With Mike Postle, I mean, yeah. So I wasn't just playing on the live stream. I was doing commentary. So yes. I was able to play with him at the table. And I was also able to do commentary as he played. 
which is a big difference in perception. Because when you're playing at the live table, there's a lot going on, especially my game. I had a private game at Stones that was live streamed called Veronica and Friends. And there's just so much going on. Everybody's drinking. Everybody's loud. A really good cash game. And so it's harder to notice him um, doing these really obvious things because there's just so much going on. But doing commentary is mostly where I noticed he was being very peculiar, very interesting. And then I went back and watched some of my live streams that I played on the table with him and things just didn't make sense. So I was, me along with this uh, gentleman named Jake Rosensteel, the two of us were the first commentators on Stones Live. So I was there from day one. I was playing on that table and doing commentary from day one. So when you can see the other, the player's hand, the, the exact hand, yeah, it's way easier to spot the weird behavior. Yeah, I didn't think that it's very... But the camera wasn't always on him too. So oh. I bet if we had the footage that's just on him the whole game, five hours, it would be really noticeable. Yes, I understand. So one of the, the first questions that came into my mind, we have the time frame, it took you some time. I, we, we, rem we remember because we have seen all those live streams that stayed online uh, for a long time afterwards. So we could check them out and we saw your frustration and especially the hands were so weird. But you have said that you talked to other players who played at that table and they also expressed concerns to you before you came public, you went public with it. My question is, why didn't they come forward with their suspicion? How come it was you who first expressed concerns about the legitimacy of that game? Um, so I probably was one of the first to go to Stone's management, and the person I went to was the person that was helping him. So the part of the issue with all of this is that it was an inside job, and the person who was supposed to be in charge of the integrity of the game was the one that was helping Mike. And so he was gaslighting me and everyone else who went and complained to him. I wasn't the only one who complained to him. I did go early on and I was gaslit, uh, but several other people and patrons of Stones went to him, Justin, um, Justin Caritas, who was the tournament director and the person who ran Stones. He gaslit everyone and did his best to manage people and uh what they were saying yes it's amazing because if you see the hands and you don't need to know like exceptional poker strategy i'm not a professional poker player anymore i have some basic strategy no uh, poker strategy knowledge it's very obvious it's there are some points some hands that are like yeah but you have to understand in hindsight it's obvious yes and yes. there's like many variables involved in this so number one justin did a really good job to keep viewership at a minimum on stream. There was no linear improvement in viewership in the show. It was gradually decreasing because what he was doing was trying to keep professional eyes off of it. Um, and so it was just it was just a live stream for them to share cards with Mike Possel so that they could vacuum up all the money. There was no there was no the promotion started getting less and less as the cheating started increasing. And not a lot of people watched the show. So the poker players in the room who weren't playing on the live stream, there's a lot of poker players who didn't play on the live stream who heard that he was potentially cheating, but they didn't watch the live stream. So how would they know? And then people at the table, it's hard to notice one player doing something peculiar if there's just so much going on and there's other players and you got to play your hands and... Um, and then when I spoke with people, some people were like, hey, in a vacuum, he could be doing this for this reason. I've seen people do it. You know, a lot of people wouldn't look at the many variables um, involved in the cheating. And that's what mostly got me. It wasn't, I mean, it was definitely the, the win rate and like the, the things he did that just weren't a thing. Um, but also off the table, when I spoke with him, he couldn't 
cognitively make sense of of the hands and he seemed like like a like pretty dumb about his plays he couldn't make sense of it even an even a brand new player can cognitively walk you through their decision making process as to why they did something doesn't mean it was right but they can walk you through it mm. but he just he just didn't have the capacity to walk me through any hands Yes, too many red flags, but uh, what I want to take out from your answer is that I realized exactly what you said in hindsight, because we saw after the suspicion was out, after Joey Ingram was already massively uh, investigating with our, his own hour-long videos, five-hour-long videos, and we've seen all the data collected and we say, oh, it's very obvious, but while living through it, it's one hand here, one hand there, not, no, not a lot of people watching the stream. It's obvious in hindsight and it's obvious also when you have all the data collected in one place. <laughs> yes. Right. And there were just many things. Uh, he was cheating for about uh, just over a year and I was suspecting him of it and I already went to management. And then suddenly he stopped cheating one summer and that was because Justin Caritas went to Las Vegas and worked at the World Series of Poker as a floor. And there was no one there to help Mike. So Mike stopped playing for two months. And then he still came to my game twice. So he played twice in two months. And he lost. And he played badly. And then in my mind, I'm like, maybe I was wrong. Maybe he's not cheating. Like, this is not... He didn't win tonight. He played terribly. Maybe he's not cheating. So I was, you know, also confused because they had that break, that two-month break where they didn't cheat. Exactly. Then that brings me exactly to my next question because you, I was about to ask you if there was no fear of being wrong, and you just asked me, you just answered that, that there was well, fear. At there some is point. always a fear. There's always a fear of being wrong because in poker your reputation is everything, and um, you know I was very insecure about my thoughts on his cheating because I'm not a professional poker player, and I'm not as well studied as some of the guys I went to and I said, I think he might be cheating. And they said, no, you're wrong because, you know, sometimes you can do this in this spot. And, you know, like it didn't make sense to me. And then I was gaslit by the tournament director who was running Stones Live, Justin Caritas. And I, I was very insecure about my own understanding of whether or not he was cheating. But the last time I did commentary, I thought there was like a 95% chance that he was cheating but in the off chance that he wasn't cheating, it would be a good thing to get people looking at his hands and people outside of Stones, and then they can decide. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But at that point, when I finally went public with it, I had decided that I was okay with potentially being wrong, but someone needed to look at it. Thank you so much for these answers. Yes, it's it's very very what you did is very courageous. It's uh, as we mentioned in the gambling story in the do mini do mini documentary, being a woman while expressing concerns about the, legit the legitimacy. I'm sorry, I haven't spoke a lot of English for a long time. But no, you're doing great. <laughs> thank you. Being a woman while while expressing concerns for the legitimacy of a poker game of a specific game is even riskier than being a man. This is an extra reason to admire your and to respect your courage and uh, to come forward with this. Well, I had gotten to a point where I thought I when I went public, I didn't think that the tournament director was helping him. It was only like a week after that I had realized that he was helping him, and it all made sense. But I thought he was incompetent. And I thought I needed to do something because an incompetent person was in charge of the game. Yes. And if somebody sees the hands and still says, no, he's a great player, then he's hurting his own. And like... I want them in my game. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> They're terrible. If they see these hands and they say, no, it's correct. Like I remember a hand, he had, he had 10 jack and uh, the other guy had nines. And the flop has, comes nine high. He has nothing and he check calls. And on the turn, he hits a 10 or a jack. Like you call, you float with your overcards, you hit one of them, and then he check folds. Like, no. Yeah, a lot of what he did was just didn't make sense to me. A lot, a lot of the things. If you're floating the flop, you would never just check fold that turn. Exactly. It was like, wow. And I was trying to explain this hand. I thought it was very obvious in this hand, like I took one hand. And I was trying to explain, to explain this to a friend of mine. And he couldn't understand it. Understand it. He was a recreational uh, player. So, like, again, when I talk about different variables involved, um, 
one of the things was when he would do this stuff, Justin Caritas would jump in the chat and he would say, oh, we got the Mike Postle's hand was wrong. He's not that good, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Justin was never concerned with my hands or anyone else's hands or a crazy whale comes into town and plays 90% V-pip yeah. and does the craziest shit. And Justin never went in the chat and chatted about them. It was only Mike Postle. He only changed Mike Postle's hands. He only covered up for Mike Postle. Yeah, that is very, very suspicious. Yeah, you can go into the chat, especially the last like uh, two, three months. You can go into the chat from the live stream because all the Stones live streams are still up. And you can see Justin Caritas jumping in there and making excuses for Mike's obvious crazy plays. It's, yeah, it's, it, I don't understand the behavior. You could, you could handle it better for his point of view. Do you regret any of your actions? That's a question actually from a friend uh, at our Discord server at Casino Slot, Constantinos asks, do you regret any of your actions? Actions? Do you think in hindsight that you could have done something differently? That's an interesting question because they're really, the all, we really didn't win anything. Like we didn't come out uh, the better from it, right? They're still like, prevalent cheating in poker there's um i got sued joey ingram got sued uh my legal bills were over a hundred thousand dollars you know um everybody lost in this case the doj didn't want to look into it um mike possel still basically got away with it and um like we got him out of the game i guess and we we shut down a corrupt live stream, but is there anything I regret? I don't know. It's hard to say that because my life's, um, there was like a lot of good that came out of this, but a, a, a whole lot of bad. Mm, so if you could just have the option to, to kick them to kick Mike Postle and, uh, out of the game and just to us out of the casino without any of the fame that some people are accusing you of earning from that story, but without anything, would you prefer that solution? The quiet one? There was no quiet way out of this. There this was. was the only way it could have happened. There was, I tried the quiet way. Everyone tried the quiet way. It didn't work. This was the only way it could happen. So, you know, if can I exist while I know that there is a cheater in a game or, uh, you know, can I just like not go back there? I don't, I'm not that type of person. Like I have to say something. If I see that there's cheating, if I see that someone's being taken advantage of, if I see any sort of corruption, I just have to say something. I just like, I'm not the type of person who can just turn my back on it. Thank you. And uh, you said before that uh, live cheating, uh, cheating in general is still going on. How safe do you feel playing in a live game today? Do you think that this story, along with some others that have come up lately, all these stories have uh, contributed to improvement of security measures on live games? So I think of uh, life as being one of those things where there are people constantly trying to gain an edge. And in every, in every way, and it seems like the most elite people have found an edge. And that's not always a legal edge, I guess. Um, I heard, you know, at the World Series of Poker and the sit and goes, there was a ton of collusion. And I would say, like, for the most part in cash games, I feel like mostly safe. I don't know how I feel about online poker, considering, um, you know, uh, real time assistance. Um, yeah, RTA. Um, I. I don't know. I think that people will take advantage and sometimes there's soft cheating that we don't do anything about, you know, like checking it down with your buddy. And is that really cheating or, you know, choosing to go after certain players and every every rag at the table is just basically fighting for the whales money and they're not really playing hard against each other. I don't know. Like, I don't I don't. I don't think that it ends at poker. I think that in every situation in life, people are going to try to find edges. And um, yeah, I'm just a, I'm a little bit pessimistic about 
about everything right now. Hmm. Uh, I'm not far off, yeah. <laughs> You're looking at the world, you cannot be very easily p optimistic, but let's hope one day we will become both optimistic. So uh, let's go to other, a few other questions from our Discord server. Was there a point, no, you, you answered those, that were you, you, you were close to give up. But he asks, it, the, the, the question is about uh, from the pressure, from the outside pressure, was there a point you were ready to just fold and crumble, just say, okay, I want to give up, I don't care anymore? I think, yeah, I yes. think like within the first 24 hours, uh, I was on Ooh. the, I called Matt Berkey and I was like crying to him and I was like, um, you know, I, what if I'm wrong here? Uh, you know, what if I ruin this guy's life? And he's like, well, you already put the tweets out. Don't worry about it. There's always forgiveness. Uh, you can just put out an apology tweet. Don't do it right now. Just like let the dust settle and see what people think. And then if you're wrong later on, just put out some apology tweets. Like, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's good that you did this. It put some eyes on it. And um, yeah, I mean, there, there was a time I remember on Sunday morning, I tried calling Mike Postel because he and then he responded. He texted me back and he's like, uh, I'm getting a lawyer. Um, I don't know what's going on. You know, he sent me some weird shit. Um, but like looking back, he responded appropriately for someone who got caught cheating. Yeah, and the name was out because at, at your tweets you were you didn't name anyone. No, but I I mean I I, I attached the video ah, okay, okay, on okay, my okay. YouTube channel and oh. it was clear that it was Mike. Okay, okay. So yeah, and um, why did this case cause so much noise? What's so special about this story? Because it's so obvious when we all look at all the video footage and it's surprising to everyone how obvious it was and how long he got away with it for, for 18 months. It's, so I think, mm. and I, I think it's like our biggest cheating scandal and it was live streamed. Yes. And it was like, it's almost funny the stance that the casino took, like yes. just a hard stance saying it didn't happen and then wanted everyone to sign uh, the settlement that said that they found no cheating, the DOJ found no cheating. And it was, it's just like, it's, it's, you know, like the emperor, the naked emperor saying he has, he's wearing new clothes. You know, it's kind of like those things. Like we're all, we're all like, just because you want us to sign something that says that it didn't happen, but it did happen. It doesn't matter whether or not anyone signed anything. It's just, it, it was just like a absurd thing from the casino. Scott Silver actually slammed them on a tweet saying like it's ridiculous to claim that nothing happened. <laughs> why why play yeah. there? Why play at a place which claims that nothing happened? It's very weird. They're, they're hurting their reputation even more. Do you think... Well, so if they admitted that something happened, then that's electronic help from an employee. That would shut them down. That's why they took oh, that stand. They I had no know. choice. Oh. Yeah, they would have been shut down. I didn't know that uh, the detail. Maybe I could have included yeah, they it. Couldn't, they didn't fire Justin for like a year. Um, they had to pretend like all was okay just so they wouldn't get shut down. Mm. And the DOJ just incompetently decided not to, to investigate. Decided, yeah, I mean, they, they investigated. Yes. Investigated. It, um, but they didn't really. Is it true that there is a law in the USA that generally, especially in California, it's very hard to, to claim money lost in gambling? Yeah, so I'm not a lawyer. I don't know exactly how the law was written, but that's why we lost our lawsuit was there's a law saying that you can't go to the court to try to receive back gambling losses. Yeah, something like that. I've heard about it. So could this story be in a book or a script for a movie? And have you ever thought in writing either of those, a book or a script? Yeah, I'm writing a book. I'm like 80% done. Oh, um, yeah, and I'm putting in details in there that um, didn't come out in um, Wired magazine or any other uh, publisher, anything published. Um, lots of things I heard from people who didn't want to be named. Um, I know so many little details uh, from people who contacted me after they signed 
the agreement uh, when they sued Stones and they did the settlement and they signed it and now they can't talk. They're like, called me right before they signed it and told me everything and yeah. Oh, interesting. So did did we have some breaking news here or have you t said, have you announced this book? Um, I don't know if I've like, like properly announced it because I'm still working on it, but um, I announced it when I, I did an interview with Molly Bloom from Molly's Game and I okay. told her I was writing the book. But, um, okay, so you are in the procedure of writing a book. That's very interesting. And that's a very good question, again, from our Discord server, the same guy, Konstantinos. I haven't thought of asking you this, but I didn't know about... So, Molly broke... Molly, her name? Uh, Molly Bloom, yes. She broke the news. We are coming second. That's okay. That's enough for us now. And uh, <laughs> do you have any, any opinion about the most recent scandal in poker do you have anything to say about the Bryn Kenney saga and this weird story you summed it up very well on Twitter um, I don't know the full details of his cheating I think they were like multi tabling and ghosting um, online poker has a whole host of issues um, and I don't know how they can solve the cheating online. Uh, mostly like with RTAing, uh, people using real-time assistance, uh, like let's say you can code um, an RTA app and you've got a fast, well-run RTA um, and then your neighbor coded one also. Like it's basically we're going to be, how do you detect them first of all? Uh, especially if they're custom made and then how are you um i feel like poker online is going to be like who can code the best rta or who can afford the best one i i feel like there's gone are the days of like where it's just like a human grinding four tables or 16 tables or whatever whatever they're doing um i i think as technology is exponentially uh, improving uh, we're not going to be able to have just like a bare bones poker game online anymore. I don't know. Do you think that also, this also has plagued the lower stakes games and tournaments? Online? Yes. Like I, I think it's everywhere. Fifty dollar yeah. tournaments and a hundred dollar tournaments have. Why wouldn't? Why like? Wh wouldn't you want to do it there? Where because you're like RTA watching? doesn't like guarantee your win. It guarantees like uh, an advantage, but it's all. It also I, it costs I a lot. It your, I think if you're. It costs if your opponents a lot. Don't have it over yeah. the long term. It is guaranteed. Yes, of you. course, but. Uh, it's costly first, and then you cannot play too many tables because you have to, to be RTAing one table. You cannot RTA a lot of tables at the same time. So, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think in any game that we have anywhere online or live, people are going to try to try to find an edge. And until that edge is illegal, they will push the boundaries of what is illegal. Okay, and I understand, I, but yes. I'm I don't just, know if that's the answer you're looking for. I I'm guess. just asking you just to, to not scare the, the like uh, $10 tournament players who are thinking that uh, my $10 tournament, there is an RTA what, opponent. Why would you, what, like, it's not about being scared. It's about being objectively knowledgeable about what's out there and making the best decision possible with your money. Okay. Uh, it's not like, oh, don't be scared. This, there shouldn't be like a lot of emotion in this decision. You should just be like aware of the risks, aware of of uh, how much money you're capable of losing, and um, playing that way. And then if you enjoy it, study it and try to solve it. <laughs> not by the use of software. Um, no, I mean, I mean that's eventually going to happen. I feel like everyone's going to be using it. I don't know what to tell you. I, I see technology. I mean, we use like RTA. I mean, like we're running analytics for sports betting and um, even the stock market, even though I don't think it's like that much of an edge. Yes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Veronica is a developer. Her profession, her day job is a developer. And she was saying before that, you were saying before, Veronica, that it's you have a day job and that's why you don't have enough time, as I do, to improve uh, at poker. At least for me, it's an excuse. I know I'm, I don't put 
the slightest effort. I, I just want to clarify, I work in software. I'm not a developer. I ah. do work with code, but I'm not a developer. Sorry. I work with developer. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I'm systems and uh, systems uh, analyst. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Maybe I translated no, this okay. differently. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. So now I would uh, like for the for the end of this interview to go to through a small game, not a very long one, just a fun game. I'm going to tell you questions with multiple choice answers. Some questions have two answers, some three, some four. It's, it's a fun game. I decide the game <laughs> and the correct answer is what uh, I think. I'm sorry, okay. it, it sounds too egoistic, but it's it's a game. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I'm still like, I can't believe that I'm still talking to you. Anyway, so according to you, to your, in your, according to your opinion, no, according to my opinion, who is the best poker commentator? Now I want to listen to your opinion. That's why I'm asking the question. What's correct answer is not important. Who is the best commentator between uh, Josh Stapleton, Norman Chad, or Gabe Kaplan? Gabe Kaplan on high stakes show. Oh gosh, this is such a tough answer. So Joe Stapleton's like one of my close friends. I love him, <laughs> but I have a love, and maybe it's just because it's nostalgic. But high stakes poker with Gabe Kaplan is my favorite. I could watch that endlessly. I know that he. I, it's funny because I, I find a lot of the best poker commentators to not be purely analytical or Gabe Kaplan is not analytical at all. He just like delicately ballets through the hands. And um, I, uh, Ali on Poker After Dark is also kind of like that. But Gabe, Gabe Kaplan is just, he's just, the, I think, a brilliant commentator. I love, it's like he's a storyteller. <laughs> I agree 100% with your description, exactly. His comments were so neatly put at the correct points. So also, what's the right answer? It was Gabe Kaplan, yes, for high stakes. And uh, I'm sorry to Joe Stapleton. Yeah, I'm winning. I'm sorry, Joe, for not ask, uh, choosing you. Joe is a close second because his jokes are amazing. Like, his jokes are so well put also. He funny he threw me a birthday party this year i went to la stayed at his house he threw me a big birthday party he's so awesome i would like to meet him from up close because i've worked with him when i was a european poker tour commentator and i was doing also the live streams and working remotely i haven't even seen seen him from up close anyway correct co correct uh, answer on the first question congrats congratulations uh, the next one is about movies and there's there are a few old classical Euro classical european music not classical uh, movies I'm starting to lose my words. Sorry. Two classic uh, European movies, not very old. One is Train Spotting, and the other one is Snatch. Which do you think would you prefer if you have seen both of them? If you haven't, it's uh, a boy. Train Spotting. Train Spotting. Train I Spotting. Think. You prefer it from Guy Ritchie's yeah. Snatch. Snatch is very yeah. well directed and has very weird tricks at the direction. But uh, yeah, Train Spotting. Train Spotting is way class, cl more classic, I think. Yeah, if yeah. you can say that in English, I don't know. <laughs> so, I hope I win a big prize. It's a big prize. I'm gonna send it to you from Greece. Uh, you just have to tell me your uh, your address. I won't we won't say it in public, and uh, you will choose your prize, your okay. prize later on. <laughs> so the last question, a very important one: Which series on Netflix actually is the best according to your and my opinion? Breaking Bad, Black Mirror, Stranger Things. Or Better Call Saul with Breaking Bad, like there are a lot of people are talking about these two specifically. Specifically, so yeah. for me, I would pick Black Mirror, but I feel like you're the type of guy who would pick uh, Breaking Bad. No, I just did this when you did Black Mirror. Black Mirror. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, I love it. I think it's one of the best ever written on screen. Like yeah. either, it's amazing the, the imagination of the yeah. screenwriters are amazing. So thank you very much, Veronica, for being this. You just won a, ge a gift. Uh, I will send it to you. It's a it's a real gift, but I don't want to use the brand like to advertise the brand through this podcast. I don't want to use this podcast for advertisement. Oh, but I thought I was going to win a million dollars. No, I'm sorry. We don't have such a budget. <laughs> it's way smaller, but it's a few zeros less. <laughs> Not a lot, not all of them, not all the zeros. <laughs> so thank you very much. We will, uh, I, I will be happy for you to accept our present. I think you know what it is, but I don't want to use this podcast to advertise another company. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I think you, I hope you will accept it. And uh, yes, 
I'm amazed that you got everything exactly what I think. Thank you very much for, I feel, I was correct for feeling like close to you when you started writing those things. I, I was immediately connected to this story because of your personality. I don't know. It's, it's very nice. Thank you for having, for accepting this invitation again. Yeah, no, thank you for your time. And uh, I really appreciate it. And it was really nice talking to you. Do you keep your podcast? Because you had some podcasts. Uh, do you still do interviews or do you think about continuing that? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm a little, I don't love it. I feel like it doesn't have a good direction. So I want to think about if I want to keep doing it, what direction I want to take it. Thank you. Okay. I, it was just a question so we can uh, promote it. If you want, you can check out the interviews. Uh, there are ver some very interesting interviews. Veronica has uh, taken at her channel, Veronica Brill, at, on YouTube. And some interviews that I used for as a source for my for our gambling story and uh, Casino Slot. So, thanks again. Another, <laughs> another goodbye. Thank you, viewers, for watching us, for spending this time uh, for seeing this interview, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And thank you, Veronica, again. Thank you. Have a great rest of your night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.